All right, hello everyone, good afternoon. We're gonna go ahead and get started with this uh, workshop, um, Teaching for Diversity and Equity. Um, we're gonna start with um, some introductions to the team here at Bryn Mawr that, that have put together this workshop. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the goals for the workshop and, um, and then Jenny will get us started with the first um, plan for the workshop. Um, this workshop and the idea for it um, grew out of a grant we have um, from the um, Project Kaleidoscope um, STEM initiative within AAC and U that's really focusing on helping faculty develop capacity to create um, uh, more equitable and inclusive classroom environments across all disciplines. Um, and we've put together a program that I hope will be very interactive and useful to you. The, before I make introductions to the team, I just wanted to, to specify and articulate what some of the goals for the uh, workshop are. First, we wanted to uh, communicate uh, to you all um, what do we know about teaching to enhance um, inclusivity, equity, and diversity in the classroom in the area of scholarship and practice. We want to give you a chance to reflect on your own practice, what's working well for you, what would you would like to improve. Uh, we want to give you an opportunity to learn about strategies and work with some case studies to kind of practice analyzing a situation or brainstorming around what, as a faculty member, you could do. Um, and then an opportunity to maybe think about any particular strategy or what you've learned and how you might implement it in a course or in a, in a scenario at your own campus. And then we'll wrap up with some uh, takeaways. So let me introduce the team, which includes Jenny, who's going to get us started on the introduction to the research. So we have Jenny Spore, who most of you know already. Jenny's our coordinator for academic technology initiatives on campus, mm -hmm. and the, really the, uh, the wonderful person behind the scenes of this whole conference. She has two uh, partners in crime. <laughs> Jancy has the title of Research Assistant for Blended Learning here at Bryn Mawr. And Esther has the title of Mellon Digital Consultant Assistant. And I myself and Liz McCormick, the Associate Provost here and a Professor of Physics, and the PI on the TIDES grant, which is the kind of um, impetus for this um, workshop. So I'll invite Jenny to go ahead and get started. We should also say that um, Esther and Jancy are former students, recent graduates. So they have both the perspective of and you know, training in, in these issues, but also the perspective of a student to draw on, which I think is very has been very helpful. Um, and we did have a lot of faculty advising us on the content. Oh, oh, that's right, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, yeah in particular, um, Allison Cook Sather, who is a, a faculty member here at Bemar in our education teaching learning initiative, our education department, who does a lot of work with the student voice and how to bring that into the classroom. So, so again, this is sort of the plan that um, Liz kind of recapped. So we're going to um, talk a little bit about values and intentions and then kind of go into the quick um, sort of uh, synopsis of the research around this. And then you guys are going to break out and we're going to try and see if we can um, implement or think about how we would implement some of these things. Right. So the first thing we'd like to have you do a little thinking about and reflection on are these four questions. So we'd like to ask you to take out a piece of paper or a pen and actually answer these four questions in writing. And we have some pads to write on if you can Okay. So, why are you here at this workshop? What goals do you have for the students that you teach? And what is working? Which of those goals is being realized in your classrooms and in your teaching? And then finally, what isn't working? What would you like to go better in your classrooms? What's not being realized? Are these goals supposed to be very general or just related to diversity and equity? Uh, they could be general, but we were thinking by thinking about the first reason you're here. Okay. So in context to your interest in this area, what do you think is working well and what's not working well? Um, we had a hard time coming up with a word, too. Is it goals? Is it what do you want for your students? Is it, you know, aspirations? <laughs> All right. It looks like most folks are um, looking up. I'd like you to find a partner next to you or someone who's sitting a, a, a singleton to get together in a pair and share some of the things you wrote down. 
Um, find a partner and exchange something that you need now. I want to invite folks to maybe um, share a few um, goals you have for your students, what's working, what's not working, some of the reasons you're here for the workshop. If we could just share a little bit what you've been talking about. Yeah. Would you mind stating your name? Where oh, you're from? I'm sorry. It's Claire Buck. I'm a in college in Massachusetts. Um, and we didn't introduce ourselves after our first. <laughs> 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 um, I got two of them. Um, but we, we got into a conversation about goals that surrounded questions of persistence and resilience in, um, in students and how much we were. Um, how much they we was able to support that learning and what and whether we were sufficiently attentive to different needs, the mm -hmm. different challenges students face. Mm -hmm. in, in it. All right, thank you, thank you. Yes. So we, one of the things that we talked about, I'm, I'm Nell Anderson, and this is Isabel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we discussed that we're both from Denver, but we have met each other. <laughs> we talked, well, I mentioned that with um, one of the program that I work with is called Praxis, and it's an experiential community based learning program. And I, one of my goals is for students to find, to be able to access the program and to actually make it work for them and to um, be engaged and to use the resources of the office if there are issues, like if things aren't working, to use be able to use the support available. And I'd say probably about half of them don't really effectively use the resources that are available mm -hmm. to, to solve problems. And um, and so when I say that, I don't agree that that was also a yeah, completely, different, completely different topic, right? I teach mathematics, mm -hmm. and yet um, students are, there. there is a group of students that will not ask you questions, because then you might, you might know mm -hmm. um, that you know, they're, they're not the strongest student in the room. Um, and so it was, yeah, completely different perspectives, but both of us really want students to ask the questions they need to answer, they need answers. It would be interesting to see if um, the same population, regardless of like who they're trying to reach out to or trying to get help from, are the same people doing that. I think there's probably a lot of overlap. Right. Okay. Right. Other comments? Interesting things that came up in your conversations. Yep. Yeah. I'm Margaret Nelson from Allegheny College. Uh, we're both in the biology department. This is Kevin and Cummins. Well, I was thinking, it was partially goals, I think, for me as well as the students, but just sort of to increase people's awareness of the diversity of perspectives and experiences of other students in the classroom with them or more generally on campus. And I guess in connection with that, not to be making assumptions that everyone else has an experience like yours, or that every just because someone looks like they belong to group X, yes. their experience mm -hmm. is like every other student of group X. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So raising awareness of diversity, but also a kind of self-awareness of preconceived assumptions mm -hmm. that might be based on our societal stereotypes. Right. And I find yeah. that I very easily fall into some of those <laughs> Assumptions, you know, this, oh, this student is from that group, and therefore they are going to be weaker, or you know, or have to have that be struggling with um, economic problems or whatever. Great, thanks. Sometimes they're, we're conscious of them. Sometimes they're implicit. Yeah. And yeah. you think, uh oh, what have I been? <laughs> what have I been doing that I shouldn't have been or uh -huh. not been doing? Uh -huh. Yes, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie Nixon. I'm uh, here at Bryn Mawr College. Um, and I work in student life, um, but specifically with diversity and inclusion programs. Uh, but I think what's actually really uh, meaningful about being able to be in sort of shared space like this and focusing on these conversations is to develop the practices um, in myself to, uh, to kind of reframe my thinking. Because um, I think I often will ask myself a question, like similarly to what you all are saying about, why won't students use these resources that are available? <laughs> and really being able to pause and just ask the question in a different way. What about the resources or the way I'm offering them makes these inaccessible? Um, and, and I mean, even that sort of flipping of that question has been really, really helpful for me, I think, in small scale and in sort of programming work um, to try and be a little bit more inclusive. Um, so. Thanks. 
Yes. Yes. And I think that that has to do also with the previous experience. At least uh, where I work, Texas Lutheran University, we have a large Hispanic population. And many of the students feel that every time I suggest to go to the tutors for one reason or another, uh, they feel that uh, they are being punished, you know, mm -hmm. because I need to send them to the tutor. But certainly that is not the case. So that has it's changing a little bit now instead of using the word tutor, you know, for the person that has to help them, we use the term learning assistant or something like that. So it's not like going to the tutor, but going going to someone who is gonna be provide their help, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to learn a little better. So Jenny's gonna tell us a little bit about um, some of the scholarship in this area and I I think you'll see some of the things you've raised show up in the examples she's gonna show. So um, we build this as research and practice. This is sort of the research part. Um, many of you may be familiar with some of this, but um, one, you know, this is for those of you who aren't or if you need a refresher. Um, and then also it's kind of interesting to put all this research together, which we were doing as we were um, discussing this and realizing some of the synergies between them that we hadn't thought of. So just as a background, um, what sort of brings us here is that there's a lot of sort of a wide body of research that shows us that students are less likely to succeed in college if they're a member of an underrepresented minority group, minority group of some kind on campus, um, if they're a first generation college student, or they're economically disadvantaged. And many of our students are a combination of some of these. Um, and this isn't just about under uh, college readiness, right? It's not just a gap in preparation, that there's more going on here. And so um, the research that I'm going over is kind of uh, what else is going on, right? What people have been finding. So how many of you have heard of stereotype threat? Oh, good. Um, this is uh, Claude Steele, I think is the, the sort of most recent and very accessible book called Whistling Vivaldi. I have a copy of it right here. You're welcome to thumb through it. I highly recommend it. It's a very quick read. Um, it's also a good thing for students to read, I think. Um, but he essentially talks about sort of the, the idea of stereotype threat is that stereotypes have a real effect on people's performance. And he did a number of tests where he sort of um, had students ha take an exam. For example, one of the theories that this came out with uh, women and um, their math performance, right? Women tend to do more poorly on math exams and uh, standardized math exams than their male peers. Um, and what he sort of discovered is if you give the, the students a test in which you tell the women, oh, you may have heard this, but in this particular test, we've worked on it so it's gender neutral, that effect doesn't happen, even if it's the same test, right, that the performance gap goes away. And they've replicated this in various instances with various kinds of stereotypes. And the idea behind it is, when you're struggling with something, so the tests that they were using were difficult, right? When you're struggling with something and there's a stereotype connected to you that suggests women may be poor at this or um, African Americans may not do as well on spatial thinking or whatever, that that becomes a possible explanation for the difficulty that you're having, okay? So there's two things kind of going on here. If you're unaware of the sort of stereotype and stereotype threats, you might be thinking, oh my God, I'm just having, this is just hard because I'm, I'm a woman and you know, I'm just not good at this and blah, blah, blah. And so it's, it's taking some, in various sessions I've heard people mention sort of the cognitive load, right? It's, it's taking up some of the valuable brain power you could be using just to do the test. Even if you're aware of the stereotype, there's a, a sort of stress involved in not wanting to prove the stereotype correct, right? So, so even if you do know about this, right, it does help to kind of know that there's the stereotype threat going on, but even then, it's still an issue of um, sort of extra mental activity around the stereotype. Yes? Just wondering, is that strictly traditional college age students, or is that maybe also adult learners? I just wanted to... Yeah, no, they've done studies of that sort and all different kinds. In this particular study with the SAT math, it was for traditional college age women. Thank you. Sure. The other interesting thing I think about Steele's, um, the research that Steele describes that I sometimes gets lost in, in descriptions of it that I've seen is the, um, the effect that stereotypes have on those of us who are observing students. So we interpret what's going on with students or their behaviors in terms of 
stereotypes sometimes. We have a tendency to do this, and that can have um, negative effects or less, less optimal effects. And the example that he gives, it's very powerful in the book, he talks about uh, a guy who was studying why African American students were doing particularly poorly in this class at Berkeley. So as a calculus course, they were overrepresented among the students who were doing poorly, underrepresented among the students who were doing well. Okay. When he, the person conducting the research went and talked to various faculty members, student support services, you know, about what, what was going on here, what, why is this happening, the thing that he heard again and again was these students are coming from, um, you know, the backgrounds aren't as strong, they're coming from schools where math wasn't emphasized, you know, these kinds of sort of underpreparedness kind of um, suggestions as a reason for this happening. But this researcher also went and followed different students as they went about preparing for this course and watched how they studied and how they planned. And what he discovered is the biggest difference was that African American students would hole up in their, um, in their dorm rooms by themselves and work through the problems and work through the problems and work through the problems and work through the problems. The, through the, through the, problems. the group that was um, doing sort of overrepresented among students that were doing well were Asian and Asian American students. They, by contrast, were working in groups. They were doing all of their homework together. They were helping one another out. They were going over. And everybody else was kind of in the middle, both in terms of where they were doing in the class and in terms of how they prepared. And so what he discovered, the next sort of iteration of the class, the uh, intervention that they had was they made everybody work in groups like this. And they saw a lot of the performance gaps disappear. So what was really working was the group work and the activities and things like that. And yes, the two. Uh, different kinds of students or different <clears throat> groups of students were sort of socialized in different ways around this. Many of the African American students felt like, um, you know, if they're not succeeding, they just needed to work harder. And that was the message that they had gotten all throughout their um, educational career from their parents, what have you. Whereas many of the Asian students had been socialized in a way that it was, it was expected and very acceptable to work in groups and things like this. So yes, there was that difference, but it had nothing to do with preparedness, right? And so had he not taken the time to sort of figure out what it was that was going on with these students from the student's perspective, he might, you know, the, the, the um, interventions that you were trying might not have been good. So that's kind of like Stephanie sort of, wait a minute, what is it about this that I'm doing that might be working, right? Yes. I mean, I think it's worthwhile, worthwhile saying who this is. This is Jerry Treisman. Right. right. That's Jerry yes. Thank you. It's probably my notes, but you notice I'm not speaking from this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, microaggressions, anyone? Yes, widely in the news, right? And again, this is this idea of um, sort of uh, things that uh, unintended discrimination and statements that reinforce stereotypes, that affirm stereotypes, um, that assume a group is homogeneous, right? Then you are, you know, you white person, tell us what white people think, kind of thing, right? That kind of comment. Um, the, I sort of put two, uh, we should say we have a resource packet for you guys that will give you, so you don't have to remember all this, but um, the, the two sort of key, um, key things here, I think it's interesting that the, uh, there was a psychologist, a social psychologist who's looking at this, first thing looking at um, implications for clinical practice, right, in working with groups, um, this is sort of where the term comes from in this first one. I find it really interesting that only two years later he's working with um, educators to figure out what this means for classroom, right? The recognition that this is really, really important. And what microaggressions, the reason they have an impact, I think, in education is what they do in terms of alienating, silencing, disengaging students who would otherwise be participating, right? Um, eroding trust, so you become sort of a hostile learning environment. You feel like you can't be... I mean, all of learning requires being vulnerable in some ways, right? And even as a faculty member, it requires being vulnerable to teach. And if you don't feel like you can do that, that's problematic. Um, and then the other thing, there's a lot of research on the sort of cumulative psychological burden of constantly dealing with these sorts of um, statements. Here's a quote I'll let you guys read. I see nodding. So are you seeing sort of how this might play out, right? This was in a study that our colleague, um, Alison cook there conducted on issues of equity and diversity in uh, teaching, right, in the higher education. And this is the kind of thing that students grapple with, right? This, um, imposter syndrome. How many of you know this? 
Okay. How many of you have experienced it? <laughs> <laughs> What's really interesting is, um, you know, and this is old research, comes out of the 70s, I think, when they were saying, why are higher achieving women not sort of embracing themselves as high achieving women, you know, and it's this idea that you can't internalize your success, that if things are happening that are good, you have a tendency to say, well, you know, that was just luck, or I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, or blah, blah, blah. Um, but then your failures, you know, every time you fail, it's like, oh my God, it's reinforcing this idea that you shouldn't be here, that, oh, if they knew, you know, if only they knew, they're thinking of me as an expert. What I think is interesting about this is in education, you know, this runs rampant um, in, in higher education. Um, I think because we're constantly pushing ourselves and we're pushing our students to the edge of their knowledge. So of course you're in a place where you feel like, oh my God, I'm just sort of winging it, you know, I have no idea, uh, and yet they think I'm so smart, you know. Um, if you talk to students about this, though, you know, first year students go through a huge period of this, right, where they get to, it's very different from what they were expecting, it's probably very different from what they came from in terms of uh, college to high school transit, high school to college transition. But if you talk to them, they think they're the only ones. Okay. Now, imagine the added burden for a student like this student who not only is feeling like, oh my God, maybe I don't belong here, but there's a stereotype, there's a language, there's an idea that's been reinforced by people who say, oh wow, you're Latina, well of course you got it, you know, kind of thing, right? These microaggressions, so you can see how this sort of feeds, right? And one thing that's problematic about the imposter syndrome and the reason that people, you know, study it, um, it's because of its impact. Students who feel this way, who feel like they're, they're imposters, um, that they shouldn't be here, that they don't belong, they're afraid to reach out, they're afraid to interact. They can't, they don't want to be vulnerable, you know, that, that sort of, I, it's again, it's a trust issue in some ways, right? I don't want to show up, my, show myself as being stupid or I don't want to confirm what everybody already knows that I really don't belong here. Um, sometimes it's, it's a sense of um, I don't, the faculty, I'm not deserving of the faculty member's attention, right, kind of thing. And so I think this all kind of comes together. But students also come in with this idea, many students, right, that um, intelligence, talent, ability, um, math skills, you either have it or you don't, right? I'm not a math person. Right. Okay, it's not something that can be developed over time. Um, and this is the work of Carol Dweck, Mindset, another book that has reached the sort of, um, what do you call it, bestseller list. Um, very good, but the idea that actually, you know, she sort of develops the fixed mindset, that's the fixed mindset, versus the growth mindset, this idea that abilities can be developed, that intelligence can be developed, that skill in something can be developed, talent can be developed, and you develop through challenge and hard work, through pushing yourself to the edge of your abilities, right? Failing, learning from that failure, and moving on, okay? Imagine how powerful that would be if you have this fear that, oh, maybe I don't belong there, if you knew that everybody else is feeling that, and if you thought, hey, of course I'm feeling that because I am pushing myself to the limit of my abilities, that's good, right? It's a very different moment, I think. Uh, oh, this was just to say that this is actually incorrect. This is not how our minds work. Our minds work this way, okay? So getting students to understand that, I think, is really important. So, so far I've talked about a lot of internal sort of cognitive barriers, right, that might interfere with learning. There are also some structural barriers, and I, I hinted at this, or Steele's work hinted at this, with the observer stereotypes that sort of lead to misdiagnosis and misapplication. Um, but I also want to talk briefly about um, this chapter, and I, I use this chapter in part because I really like the title, Craig Nelson, um, Dysfunctional Illusions of Rigor, Lessons from the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. He argues in this, and he uh, does it in several ways, but sort of that our foundational assumptions about rigor um, are problematic given these new psychological cognitive findings, right? When I was in school, I was taught that the classic sort of example of the bell curve is student grades. What are the implications of that, right? This is a rigorous course. This is what a course should look like, right? And if, if too many people are over here, it's not rigorous enough, and we need to make it harder. 
And if too many people are over here, maybe we need to kind of curve the other way, right? This idea that there's going to be this natural distribution with a few people on either end and most of the people in the middle. Well, this might work if you believe in the fixed mindset. But if you don't, and if the research shows that with enough support and with enough sort of figuring out what's going on and the right support, everyone can get to this end, then maybe we need to rethink sort of what our definition of rigor is, right? We need to kind of reconceptualize this. And one of the things they talked about a little bit, and I kind of go further maybe with it and thinking about it, is um, this is, might not be how you think of your courses, right? You might grade your students in a different way. This is often what your students think you think. Okay, so that's a, you know one thing. What is the message that we're giving to students around these sorts of things? Um, this is a very different chart. This is uh, from one of our blended learning studies where we were looking at the percentage of work that they did on the homework, online homework system, and then their final grades in the course. And the grades had nothing to do with the homework. They didn't get, you know, they got tiny little participation grade or something for the homework, but it was mostly based on their exams. And one of the things we found is, obviously, um, the more you did your homework, the better you did. Okay, and we actually did statistical analysis on it and showed that if you looked at your entering SAT math scores with the students um, that were undergraduates in this course, um, that predicted about 30% of their final grade. If you added in what they were doing in the online homework, that predicted 60%. And that's not how they were doing in the online homework, that's how much they were doing in the online homework, right? What of the assignments they completed. This is a powerful message to students, right? It's not just you're fated to either be good at math or not, right? This is if you actually do your homework, if you work hard, you can get there, right? You can get better. So I sort of leave you with this question, and I think this article also leaves you with the question, you know, what values are we communicating to students in the way that we structure assignments and courses, in the way that we say, here's what the course requirements are, you know? Um, here's what the grading scale is. And then one thing I struggle with is thinking about these sorts of things. Um, how are we going to redefine rigor so that we can say that, yes, these co courses are challenging and are hard and are, are ch as challenging as they have been in the past. We're not just giving more people A's, right? We're, um, there are actually more people are getting A's and the content stays the same, right? I think we need to rethink a little bit about how we assess courses and how we um, assess student learning to be able to say that and show that. Oh, one more thing. <laughs> this is from a pamphlet that we actually have for you guys, but I have to go find it. Um, <laughs> but it's from the AACU, and um, something that I was kind of hinting at in that last couple of slides was, notice the title of this was equity, not equality. And this is something that's, that's rough for faculty. I mean, I, you know, it's rough to think about, but Equality is sort of, you give everybody the same inputs, and then you see where they are. The idea of equity is people come in at different levels, and so the inputs you put in might be greater for some people because they need more help and less for other people, but that you give them all the same opportunity to ring the bell, right? Okay, that's kind of what this is getting at a little bit. And if this is the way we're headed, what then does it mean about rigor? Again, how do we define rigor in a way that... So, that's your task. <laughs> does anyone have any questions about the, the research or the... <laughs> so my impression is that U.S. American mindset and philosophy is very much based on equality rather than equity. Mm -hmm. And so have you found that to be a stumbling block? And how does that play out? And what do we do about it? <laughs> <laughs> That's what the workshop is all about. <laughs> In some ways, yes. I mean, I think I think the sort of model for higher education used to be um, you sink or swim, right? I mean, when I was in school, that was you sink or swim. Those of us who made it, made it. I think one of the things that people have been realizing over time is part of the reason that I made it was that my parents made it before me. And so they could advise me in ways that my friend who did not have that advantage could, right? Or I met the right people, or I happened to be in a somewhat smaller program, and those, uh, the administrative assistant in our program was very savvy about giving us advice, you know, or something like that. But there are all of these um, sort of inequalities that are behind the scenes. And I think people are now realizing that, and it's sort of 
really having to change the way we think about higher ed, right? Yeah, so it's huge. And it's a big, big, big culture shift. So um, I've worked in a number of different colleges and, and sometimes have had the role of academic advisor. And I've noticed that, I mean, things have changed a lot in the past 20 years. But it seems as though the safer skin mentality mm -hmm. is more pronounced in the sciences. Mm -hmm. And is that, is that like, why, why do the sciences embrace that so strongly? Or, like, or is that, do they just get a bad rap for that and everybody else is just as... Because it's, you know, now there's the whole emphasis on really um, opening up STEM to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, but, but before, like pre-med classes, it was perfectly normal for, you know, if students were not doing well, well, that's... That's right. The I'm purpose of an intro. No, no, no. Yes. Much better than other yes. Where I've worked, but it's it, it seems as though the science is really held on to that tightly, and right. they were protecting. Right? right. Well, the idea of an intro course, and I think it was most pronounced in the sciences, in part because intro courses in the sciences were big. But um, the idea of an intro course, um, and I saw it in the University of Texas, which is where I, I did my undergraduate work. Um, in business, for example, uh, you know, they expected a fair percentage of people to fail the introductory stuff. And in business, it was particularly tragic because it wasn't until the, your, the end of your second year that you found out whether you made the grade to move forward in the major, which meant there were all these kids who like suddenly had two years of college and no place to go. But the idea was that was a good thing. You were weeding out the people who, you know, didn't belong. And I think that that's it's like a professional responsibility to lead out. Right. Lead out right. right. And you can look at, I don't think that was as pronounced in the humanities, but I do think there's the sense of, for those of us who go on to the PhD program, right, that you're, the undergraduate as a whole is you weeding out the, the chaff, right? So maybe you get through the major, but that's it, you know, kind of thing. And maybe Mark is a physicist. Yeah, I, I think that, it, and also as, as a physicist, who's been teaching for a few decades. Um, as someone who, when, when I was taking physics, mm -hmm. the, most of the people who were teaching us were folks who were Sputnik generation faculty. Mm -hmm. That came at a time when everybody wanted to be a scientist and physics. That was the top, you know? That was the absolute goal. There were so many people who were trying to be scientists that you could not take them all on. It was such a tremendous growth area that you did not have to ask them to be there. Mm -hmm. So that it was natural to say, our job is simply to make sure that we're taking only the very best. because. Mm -hmm. It was easy, and people didn't realize that only the very best was really a very distorted view of what best meant. Mm -hmm. It meant people who came in already, as physicists would say, in Pete's match to the system. <laughs> you know, they go in there, slip right in, with exactly. no problems exactly. whatsoever. So if they were background difficulties or cultural difficulties or any of the things that you like, didn't matter because we had plenty of white males that we were going to crank right through the system. <laughs> right. And that was okay. Mm -hmm. came from suburban and selective mm -hmm. And this, that's what we mean by the structures, practices, and networks that are discriminatory. Mm -hmm. and, and, and unrecognized, unseen. Yeah. And so many of the people who are at, at, of my generation. Who taught us how to teach? Nobody. <laughs> it was simply by example. Mm -hmm. We knew how we were taught, and therefore that's the way it must be. And I think that we're now at a phase in which, in physics in particular, it's no longer the ticket, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that coupled with a lot of this research that is coming out, that says, wait a minute, what we thought happened in terms of education and ability is just dead wrong mm -hmm. means that everybody is suddenly re-examining this in a very serious way, mm -hmm. coupled with the notion that, wow, our clientele for who are going to be populating our, our selective yeah. liberal arts campuses, 
It's way different than it was back in 1967. And that's another thing, broader higher education wide, you know. Um, back when it was a very much a sink or swim thing, you didn't necessarily need a college degree to function in society, right? And so it was okay that it was a sort of sink or swim thing because, you know, now I think there's a real uh, belief, certainly the, the, the government's, you know, sort of uh, the Obama administration's latest sort of push for higher education is that we actually need more in a, in a knowledge society, right? We need more people with higher degrees. We need more people to get through, and that means we need to change sort of how we do things, I think, in many ways. It's no longer okay that some people are sinking, or some people aren't floating. Um, do we need to, I, I don't want to cut this off because it's great, but um, do we need to move on? Yes, my timekeepers are. Okay, okay. so keep all this in mind. We're going to keep talking. Um, we're going to give you guys a little 10 minute break, but before that, I want to explain the activity that we're going to do after the break. And so that activity is called Discovering Strategies. And what we did to prepare for this um, workshop is we got two papers, and those two papers provided a total of 14 strategies um, that will help create an inclusive space in your classrooms. And so we're going to have a chance to think about how to implement those strategies in the classrooms and why they're important to do so. And so um, um, before we do that, we'll probably um, count off in um, threes, um, but also I just want to preface it with while we were creating this workshop, um, it was not an easy task to create it, but also we just want to say that it's not going to be um, just very, very easy to be like, oh, this strategy is perfect and this is how you solve the problem. So definitely be open-minded and thoughtful and prepared to really do hard work when we go into these small groups. Alright, so we're going to count you guys off into three groups, and each group is going to have a two facilitators.